So the following video we'll talk about the biliary system and specifically we're going to talk about the gallbladder and the bile ducts. So we'll talk about a bunch of uh, anatomical considerations, non-neoplastic processes and neoplasms uh, and masses involving the biliary system. So we'll start off with the gallbladder and the normal dimensions of the gallbladder are anywhere between about four centimeters in its uh, transverse dimension by uh, up to about 10 centimeters in its longitudinal axis. So as long as it's within those limits, it's considered normal size. And there's of course a variability in that depending on if the patient is fasting or not. But we like four by 10 as something to remember. And in terms of the wall thickness that you can see over here, that we like to be less than three millimeters. All right, so four by 10 for the uh, dimensions of the gallbladder and the wall thickness, we like it to be less than three millimeters. Now the gallbladder on uh, ultrasound imaging you're familiar with on uh, MR imaging, for the most part, bile will be T2 hyperintense and will have a variety of appearances on T1, but generally T1 hypointense. So let's move on to something that we see a lot in gallbladders. So we see gallstones, as you can see over here, and the incidence is anywhere from 10 to 20%, so they're commonly seen. And uh, a lot of them um, are made up of either cholesterol or uh, what we call pigmented gallstones, which is precipitation of calcium bilirubinate, but the majority of them end up being mixed, so they have a variety of those um, constituents. Now in ultrasound, they tend to be echogenic, and they'll have some posterior shadowing, but that really depends on its size. So if it's less than three millimeters, we end up sometimes not seeing the shadowing. But if it's more than three, more or less, you'll see some degree of shadowing. And on MR imaging, most gallstones will be T2 hypointense. When I say most, I actually mean all gallstones will be T2 hypointense. And its T1 appearance is a little bit more variable. Purely pigmented gallstones will actually be T1 hyperintense. But as I said, majority of gallstones end up being mixed. And so you'll have a variety of appearances, T1 hyper or hypointense uh, on MR imaging. Now, of course, we should contrast that with sludge, which is just precipitation really of some biliary crystals. And so that ends up layering a lot of the times in the dependent portions of the gallbladder on uh, ultrasound imaging, they look like low-level echoes without shadowing. And on MR imaging, they end up being T2 hypointense, but not as dark as gallstones. And again, they have a variety of appearances on T1-weighted imaging. Of course, if we talk about the gallbladder, we need to start talking about sort of pathological conditions associated. And the one that, of course, everyone needs to know about is acute cholecystitis. So let's redraw our gallbladder a little bit again. And of course, the vast majority of cases of acute cholecystitis, about 95% of them, will be related to the presence of gallstones. Now about 5% will be a calculus cholecystitis, and those are when you have sludge kind of stuck at the gallbladder neck or the cystic duct. But as I said, the majority of them will be with gallstones. So we'll see a gallstone over here uh, that's impacted, and as a result of that, the gallbladder distends, so it gets increased in size, and uh, certainly more than the 4 by 10 centimeter dimension that we mentioned. The wall ends up getting a lot thicker, so we'll end up seeing the gallbladder will draw this green area for the wall that ends up being a lot more thicker. You'll end up seeing some pericholecystic fluid around it and some inflammatory change as well. And on ultrasound, at least, you'll have a positive sonographic Murphy sign. So these are all signs of acute cholecystitis. Now associated with acute cholecystitis, there's some complications. So sometimes what happens is that the gallbladder itself becomes inflamed and ischemic. And so the uh, mucosa of the gallbladder gets ischemic and uh, all of a sudden starts to disappear, something like this and uh, you can have that in certain places. A lot of the times this actually occurs at the fundus of the gallbladder over here. And what you end up getting are these kind of floating membranes of mucosa inside the gallbladder itself. And so that instance, we call it gangrenous cholecystitis. So gangrenous cholecystitis is associated with floating membranes. Now oftentimes associated with gangrenous cholecystitis is really um, a full thickness um, perforation or defect within the gallbladder wall itself. So something like this, and then again extends outwards as well through to the gallbladder serosal surface. And, and you end up getting a perforation with an abscess, something like this. Um, and so when you see that, it's uh, indicative of perforated cholecystitis. So you have abscess typically associated with that. And one of the other complications you can see if they're super infection by gas forming organisms is something called emphysematous cholecystitis. So in that instance you'll end up seeing air not really within the lumen of the gallbladder per se but really within the wall of the gallbladder. So you can see air within it. and sometimes it's associated with luminal gallbladder air. When you see that that's indicative of emphysematous cholecystitis which is a very aggressive form of infection that requires immediate 
uh, surgical uh, therapy. Another kind of interesting condition that can happen with a uh, stone kind of impact in the gallbladder neck or cystic duct is something called Neritzi syndrome. So let's draw it over here. So here you have a gallbladder that's distended because you got a stone that's uh, impacted in the uh, cystic duct or gallbladder neck. So here you have our stone. As a result of that, not only do you get gallbladder distension, but you get actual distension of the common hepatic duct and the intrahepatic bile ducts as well. So these become really, really big as a result of this impacted stone. And actually the extrahepatic tree over here looks okay. And so this is something known as Maritzi syndrome. So let's move on to a few uh, gallbladder masses. And so we'll draw another gallbladder over here. So the first kind of mass that uh, we'll talk about is something called adenomyomatosis. Now, of course, this isn't a uh, true mass per se, but it's an interesting kind of idiopathic condition in which the mucosa of the gallbladder gets very thickened. So it ends up looking something like this. Within this thickened mucosa, you have these little diverticula that form something like this, and something like this. And each of these is called a Rokitansky ashcroft sinus. They can contain bile or cholesterol crystals that can kind of precipitate um, within them. And so on ultrasound imaging, you'll see this thickened area of the gallbladder wall with some commental artifact that there's some cholesterol crystals in there. On MR, you end up seeing these the cystic spaces really containing bile. The cholesterol crystals are very, are too small to kind of detect on the MRI. And so you'll end up seeing something called a string of beads appear and string of pearls appearance. Other sort of masses you can see in the gallbladder are something called polyps. And so here you can see a polyp, they look like these polypoid masses, they protrude into the gallbladder lumen. And these polyps, the uh, vast majority end up being something benign like cholesterol polyps. They can also be inflammatory polyps. And uh, the ones that we've worried about are adenomatous polyps. And these ones end up being pre-malignant. And it's very difficult based on their imaging appearance to differentiate between these three. Now, cholesterol polyps tend to be multiple. They tend to be less than five millimeters in size. Adenomatous polyps tend to be a little bit more heterogeneous and more than 10 millimeters of size. And as a rule of thumb, if you see uh, multiple polypoid masses less than five millimeters, we typically ignore them. So less than 10 millimeters, they should warrant surgical consideration. And if they're anywhere in between, they uh, require a continued ultrasound follow-up. And finally, let's get to uh, kind of gallbladder neoplasms per se. And so you have primary neoplasms of the gallbladder and metastatic disease. Metastatic disease is much less common. So if we talk about uh, secondary neoplasms, we're really um, considering things like melanoma. It's been reported with a whole bunch of things, but melanoma and RCC tend to be a little bit more common. Primary neoplasms of the gallbladder, vast majority, by 95%, will be adenocarcinomas. Uh, occasionally you'll see squamous cell cancers. There's also lymphomas of the gallbladder that have been reported. But again, adenocarcinoma will be by far the most common. And these really have a variety of appearances. Uh, they can be infiltrative masses that essentially replace the entire gallbladder itself. You can have polypoid masses such as, you know, this lesion over here. And a lot of the times these masses tend to invade the adjacent liver surface. So if we draw the liver surface over here, uh, you know, these masses tend to go and invade the liver surface. So one needs to be careful to see that uh, invasion and they have a propensity to cause peritoneocarcinomatosis as well. So let's start talking about the uh, bile ducts themselves. And in terms of uh, kind of normal anatomic considerations, um, we'll start off with the uh, right intrahepatic bile duct over here. And then you have the left intrahepatic bile duct over here. These join to form the common hepatic duct. And the cystic duct from the gallbladder joins them. And uh, thereafter, this duct is known as the common bile duct that you can see over here. And in terms of the intrahepatic ductal anatomy, it's important to know that the right hepatic duct has branches that go to the anterior portion of the liver and the posterior portion of the liver. And there are all sorts of variations, of course, upon these ducts. Uh, ones that are important to know particularly pertain to this posterior branch, which can be quite variable. And one of the common variations is that this posterior branch actually comes off the left uh, intrahepatic bile duct like that. But one of the other um, relatively common variations is that the right uh, anterior, posterior, and left intrahepatic bile ducts kind of form um, in a trifurcation pattern together to form the common hepatic duct, and then you have the cystic duct and the common bile duct. So these are some sort of anatomic variations on the normal biliary anatomy. So before we move on to uh, you know, an inflammatory or kind of malignant uh, conditions of the bile duct, I just want to go over um, kind of some congenital anomalies that we can see. And this is mainly uh, cholidocal cysts. And so cholidocal cysts 
our um, congenital cystic dilatation of the biliary tree typically happens in a pediatric population. We don't really know why they happen, but there are a variety of different types of colidocal cysts. If we look at the uh, normal bile duct anatomy, these are the intrahepatic bile ducts, right, left, and the um, common hepatic duct and the common bile duct over here. Type 1 colidocal cyst refers to cystic dilatation of the common hepatic and bile duct itself. So all this portion here becomes dilated. That refers to type 1 colidocal cyst. Type 2 colidocal cyst is when you have a little diverticulum that comes off the biliary tree, something like this. These are quite uncommon. Type 3 is when you have a colidocal seal, so where the common bile duct enters the ampulla at the level of the duodenum, we have a cystic dilatation right over here, so that's a type 3 colidocal cyst. Type 4 has two varieties. Type 4a is when you have cystic dilatation of both the intrahepatic and the extrahepatic biliary tree, something like that. While well, a type 4b is when you have multiple cystic dilatation of only the extrahepatic bile duct tree, so something like this over here. And finally, there's a type 5 colidocal cyst, um, which is thought to be actually a separate entity in and of itself called Caroli's disease, where you have multiple areas of cystic dilatation involving the intrahepatic bile ducts, something like that. And this is known as Caroli's disease, and it's thought to be due to a ductal plate malformation. And on imaging, you'll end up seeing something called the central dot sign, where you have the portal triads in the middle and surrounding you have dilated kind of cystic dilatation of the biliary tree. So you can see that sometimes on ultrasound, CT, or MR imaging. And all of these uh, entities, colidocal cysts, Caroli's disease, pose you at an increased risk for cholangiocarcinoma. So this is something that needs to be rectified, resected as soon as possible. Let's move on to some other conditions that we more commonly see uh, within the bile ducts. So we get asked a lot of times to evaluate for colidocal lithiasis, and we're basically just looking for a stone within the extrahepatic uh, bile ducts. And stones within the extrahepatic bile ducts are going to be T2 hypointense. As we said, stones can have a variety of appearances on T1 weighted imaging. Typically, they are T1 hypointense, but they can be hyperintense if they're pigmented stones. And MRCP is particularly good for looking at these stones. Um, anything above three millimeters will be readily detected. So we're just looking for a dark kind of signal on T2 weighted imaging. And that's almost always associated with some degree of upstream biliary ductal dilatation. So that's just colidocal lithiasis. So one thing you should be careful for is this entity called peribiliary cysts. And the reason you should be careful about that is that can mimic intrahepatic ductal dilatation, but it's not really that. What they're refers to is cystic dilatation of these glands associated with the bile ducts. So if we just take the intrahepatic bile duct over here and just blow this up, it turns out that they're lined with these little tiny glands. And in certain conditions, particularly cirrhosis and autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, these glands can become dilated. And so they give the appearance of dilated biliary tree, but in fact, it's just dilatation of these peribiliary cysts. They're of no significance and nothing really needs to be done about it, but it's important to kind of be able to recognize this entity. Now, one of the other important considerations when uh, looking at the bile duct is to understand that the bile ducts are vascular supply is by the hepatic artery such that if there's any compromise to the hepatic arterial flow, whether it be thrombosis, stenosis, you're going to get biliary ischemia with bilomas. So particularly in transplant patients, if you see hepatic artery damage, always look at the biliary tree to see areas of irregular ductal dilatation, bilomas, abscesses, because they're associated with that pathology. As we move on now to kind of inflammatory conditions of the biliary tree, we're really talking about cholangitis. And if two of the things that at least from an imaging perspective, we can be relatively specific uh, about is uh, sclerosing cholangitis and recurrent pyogenic cholangitis. Now, sclerosing cholangitis, if it's idiopathic, is called primary sclerosing cholangitis, PSC, but it often is associated with other entities, most commonly IBD, and in IBD, ulcerative colitis more often than Crohn's disease. Now, from an imaging perspective, you're going to get regions of stricturing and dilatation of the biliary tree, both the extrahepatic and intrahepatic bile ducts. So you get alternating regions of dilatation, as you can see here, and stricturing, dilatation and stricturing. And this really forms what we call a string of beads appearance. And so when you kind of see that appearance, it's usually uh, very suggestive of sclerosing cholangitis. And again, if there's no etiology, 
we refer to it as primary sclerosing cholangitis. A recurrent pyogenic cholangitis is a little bit different in that it's typically seen in the East Asian population. It's associated with certain infections of the biliary tree and that causes stretching over a period of time. Now this is important. It has a propensity for the left lateral hepatic duct or left lateral hepatic lobe and the posterior right portion of the liver as well. What you end up getting is areas, if you can draw the bile duct here, this is the right portion, this is the left portion, areas of cystic dilatation. And inside these areas of cystic dilatation, you often end up seeing stones. And so that feature is quite suggestive of recurrent pyogenic cholangitis. And it's important to remember that both these entities place the patient at risk for cholangiocarcinoma. Now, one of the other things that I'll just talk about because um, there tends to be questions on this, is this concept of HIV cholangiopathy. And in HIV cholangiopathy, you end up getting an appearance that's quite similar to sclerosing cholangitis. But something that's rather unique is that you can also get areas of isolated papillary stenosis. So you'll have dilatation of the bile ducts up to the region of the ampulla. And so that's, again, indicative in the appropriate setting of HIV cholangiopathy. And from the small space over here, we'll talk about cholangiocarcinoma. And cholangiocarcinoma itself has a variety uh, of places where it can occur. Now, most commonly it ends up occurring at the hilum, and that's known as the Klatskin tumor, but it can also occur uh, out in the periphery of the bile duct. So um, you can have a peripheral location, and it can also occur within the extrahepatic biliary tree. So I'll write extra hepatic ducts as well. And particularly when it occurs in the Klatskin and the peripheral portions has a unique appearance in that it actually enhances more avidly within the delayed phase of imaging. And so you'll get this very ill-defined T2 hyperintense mass, uh, which enhances, but that enhancement will become most apparent in the delayed phase. And that's thought to be due to the fact that there's a lot of scarring and desmoplastic reaction occurring with these tumors. And so that results in the enhancement just being more evident um, when you wait a little bit longer. And we usually wait about 10 minutes uh, to get a delayed phase on these patients. And almost always, these are associated with some degree of upstream biliary ductal dilatation. And kind of the last tumor that I'll just talk about that is quite rare is a biliary cyst adenoma. And again, these are not common, but when we see them, they're typically seen in older females. Uh, they have a propensity for the uh, right hepatic lobe, and they end up looking like masses that are cystic, but they have multiple internal septations within them. And biliary cyst adenomas per se are benign tumors, but they have a malignant counterpart, biliary cyst adenocarcinoma, that you can't differentiate from biliary cyst adenoma. So these almost always have to be taken out. And finally, we'll end with a relatively benign entity that can be mistaken for uh, something malignant if you're not aware of it. And it's this entity of von Meinberg complexes. These are also known as biliary hamartomas. And von Meinberg complex uh, look like little um, tiny cysts that are spread throughout the liver. They're about five millimeters in size, and they really have a pathognomonic appearance. If you look at the liver, you'll see a bunch of them, kind of the whole liver littered with these little tiny cystic lesions. And as far as we know, they have no real malignant potential. There is some literature to suggest there may be an association with cholangiocarcinoma, but in by and large, when we see these von Meinberg complexes, we you know describe it, we call it as it is, and they really don't require much follow-up. Thank you.